Good afternoon and welcome to the first Transportation Committee of 2017. <laughs> Hope everybody had great holidays and Happy New Year. Uh, we will begin as is our uh, custom here in this committee with a multimodal roll call. Um, we'll limit it just to the new year. Uh, in the new year, who has uh, commuted by uh, bus? In the new year, who has commuted by train? Very good. Uh, bicycle. Uh, bicycle. <laughs> Mr. Weezer has moved his bicycle. Uh, <laughs> uh, pedestrian. Uh, Rideshare. Carpooling. Carpooling? Okay, well. Um, all right, well, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, <coughs> I am joined uh, today by my colleagues, uh, Ms. Martinez of the 6th District, Mr. Wiesar of the 14th, and Mr. Rue of the 4th District, uh, and we are going to get right down to business. And we will begin with, um, uh, first of all, uh, I see no general public comment cards, so I am going to close general public comment and uh, begin with item number one. Item number one is an LADOT report relative to the renewal of electric line and pipeline franchises via ordinances. Okay, and uh, before you begin, gentlemen, we have one public comment card uh, from the former representative of the 15th District and the former uh, uh, Council President Pro Tempore, Mr. Rudy Savornich. You thought I was going to forget the full title, didn't you? First of all, Happy New Year, colleagues, and it's nice to see all of you. Uh, former Council President Pro Tem Rudy Savornich, Jr., and uh, longtime former chairman of, of this committee. It's nice to be back. Uh, time is starting to go by pretty fast now, and so uh, it's always nice to be back here at City Hall. Uh, representing Plains here today, and, and we have uh, one request. Uh, in your report um, that's uh, dated the... Uh, 14th of December that is before you today, um, there was one little uh, item that we wanted to request the committee uh, amend the report to allow some latitude for city staff to be able to address some of the particular nuances in the uh, agreements that we are going to have going forth before council. Uh, the agreements are going to be negotiated with the franchisees. And back, I believe, in June, the uh, council approved some language into, a, into the template for uh, these agreements. And there are different types of pipeline franchisees in the city. I think there might be six or seven of them that's listed on the first page of the report. There's water, there's gas, there's steam, uh, there's oil. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff and each one is a little different in regards to how you should or how one could address the agreements and so in our discourse with staff staff is telling us that um, there can be not any wiggle room in regards to that language because of what was previously passed by the council and so we wanted to respectfully ask if council would please give staff the authority that if there are any little peculiarities that come up, that they can address those within, within the agreements. Uh, just as simple as that, uh, for example, on uh, some of the uh, carriers that do oil or gas, some of them are proprietary where they, have, uh, they move their own stuff, and some of the companies move stuff for others, and they're called common carriers. That's one little example. And of course, if you're moving gas through a pipeline versus a solid product, that's a little different. And so it just doesn't all fit into one nice little package. And so if indeed staff could request or make the little change that would grant staff that authority, and why staff didn't bring it to you before, I don't know. Uh, we were never asked as a franchisee of, of, if that would be an issue. And so maybe staff could be asked of that. I, I will ask staff a couple questions of that. Yeah. Uh, l let me first ask you, Mr. Savorn. My understanding is that this is a sort of a temporary stopgap. Correct. Um, and we ain't doing this the same way again. 
there needs to be a significant uh, and thorough review of how the city does these franchises uh, with all of these, uh, and I think there needs to be a very significant overhaul. Uh, this uh, process of extending the existing contracts was to give us time to to do that in a thorough and comprehensive way, Correct. Uh, particularly now that we have new uh, 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 petroleum uh, uh, expert uh, resources uh, on hand. Uh, so my understanding was we were just sort of extending what was already in existence. What would be the need to modify anything? Um, what you have said is all correct, except the one little nuance is that in regards to each of the different franchisees, and I believe, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, there's 36 of them. 35 of them are being handled one way and, and one of them because of, of how they operate. That's Edison. They have to be handled a different manner. Uh, in regards to the individual agreements that they're having with the 35 except for Edison is that that needs to be negotiated with each of the parties and then it's going to come before council. But what we have been informed by staff that there's no wiggle room for them to work outside of the template that was previously approved by council. Okay. And, 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 and we understand that this is only a stopgap for the next what, a year and nine months. We understand that. All right. Um, all right staff, please go ahead. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Robert Andalon with the Department of Transportation. Uh, specifically, what we did is uh, look at what was already in place. And we, again, uh, meeting with the City Attorney's Office, we felt that what was in place could be extended for those that have not expired. For those that have expired, we would put forward a new ordinance without changing the language in effort to maintain some kind of uniformity and standardization across the board. Um, I think that the one year and nine months, again, is a stopgap measure and it's intended to address, to allow uh, opportunity for public works and the staff to be able to address issues just as Mr. Sabornich has raised uh, in a more um, open and, and transparent manner to allow for other stakeholders and other pipeline companies that may have also similar interests that they would like to include. Um, as part of the Board of Transportation Commissioners who previously was responsible for this, they had established standard language for all of the pipeline franchises. They had multiple hearings where that language was established and so we felt that it was appropriate to continue that. Anything you want to add, Jay? Yes. Uh, I think the time to address those uh, nuanced issues for different companies is really uh, when we actually extend the terms, it's really between those times for us to then go back and uh, dig into those particular issues and actually address it for each uh, uh, individual company. For us to try to do that now for all 35 companies, uh, we wouldn't have the time. That was my concern, yeah. It just wouldn't work and the, the idea from the get-go was to actually give ourselves uh, additional time to actually go through those issues. Right. One of the additional points I'd like to point out is that uh, by having an active franchise agreement, the city is indemnified. So there is no question that that benefits the city and its residents much more than um, setting aside time to try to negotiate individually with 35 or 36 different companies. Right. So uh, honestly, I'm, I'm a, a little concerned by this uh, 11th and a half hour uh, wrinkle here in this request. Uh, I'm not prepared to vote on this today now. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, the, the, the committee to continue this until the next meeting. Uh, what Mr. Savornish may be asking may be completely reasonable. Uh, there may be unforeseen consequences to that, and I need to talk through that more uh, with, with, with staff, uh, DOT, CAO, uh, and our petroleum administrator, uh, because it just, I, I, I get what you're saying, but it just, to me, sounds counterintuitive to what this next step was supposed to be, and so I, I need to hear a little bit more about that. And Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, what you have said is ex ex uh, exactly right. We do not want to be counterproductive to what the next step was going to be, but there may be a little nuance in our discussion with staff today. We appreciate the continuance that, that what we are requesting doesn't affect what we want to do coming up in the next, in the, in the next round. Right. Uh, so does anybody have any objections to continuing this until the next meeting? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, but um, has our... Petroleum administrator had a chance to review these. That's what I want to have done in the interim, because okay. I don't think they. Oh, is Uduark? Come on up. 
Uh, good morning. Um, um, yes, I, I have seen the templates. Uh, I also did talk with the plain staff member uh, to explain the situation, just as Mr. Anvil and Mr. Kim had uh, uh, shared. Um, you know, by extending or not voting on it, uh, we continue to have the liability of having no indemnification if something goes wrong. And that's one of the, the main risks that we take as a city of not having a franchise in place is if there's an accident, a spill, uh, or something of that nature, uh, we have limited recourse. So give me your, your advice and your recommendation. I am not prepared to move forward today if we are changing the recommendation that is before us. So is your recommendation that we approve what DOT has recommended or that we continue? Uh, my, my recommendation is to move forward. I didn't, I didn't hear from Plains or from other franchisees that there was a significant issue that right. was unresolved. Uh, and, I, and I've been in discussions with uh, both them and multiple other franchisees for the last two months. Okay. All right. Mr. City Attorney? Yes. Uh, we've been negotiating these for quite some time. And the City Attorney's Office, based on the reasons outlined by Mr. Andalon, and our new petroleum administrator would be to move forward on this not only because of liability reasons but because the charter requires that these companies have a franchise in order to operate in the city right now we don't have franchises with these people they're paying us on a month-to-month -month basis and we're sort of going through the motions of well what they're still complying with their old franchise agreements I think we need to get these new franchise agreements in place as quickly as we can for on this since it's only a a year and, and a half while we go through the template and develop more do more modernization of it but I think there's a huge downside in not going forward okay. uh, any of my colleagues have questions all right well then then I'm gonna recommend we we move forward approving the recommendations as DOT has presented I don't want to be changing something that we have sort of been on a trajectory to do this way for for quite a while and I do want us to I'm sensitive to the liability questions and I do want us to be, get moving on to this new process so that we can be managing these properly Uduak? and I, and I have communicated with each of the franchisees that I've talked to that once the the authority is transferred over to the Office of Patrol administration uh, we will review all new terms and changes modernize uh, take in any particulars for the different type of categories. We recognize water is different than natural gas, than hazardous products and pipelines, so. And then this will no longer be something DOT is dealing with either, right? Right, and then we can move forward and, and, and negotiate long-term contracts Great. with everybody. Or DOT is a particularly illogical place for this process to be housed. Right, because they've been doing railroads and, and yeah. taxi cab franchises. Right, yeah, and I'm sure DOT agrees with me on that. Yes, we agree. Yes. <laughs> Clarification, uh, City Attorney, isn't it? Isn't this for one year with a nine-month um, extension if necessary? It's a one year, not an 18 months, right? It's it's a one year nine, with a nine-month extension. Yeah. So, in one year, yeah. so if we complete it within one year, then we don't need the extension. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I think the issues that were raised today, by the time they get before they get approved in council, hopefully you could sit down and see what the yeah. proposed changes between now and then, and see if that makes sense. Or That's not. also a good idea. Yeah. All right, uh, so uh, without objection, item one is approved as is. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to item number two. Item number two is the DOT report relative to changing the pricing structure of the Hollywood and Highland parking facility. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, we're here to request the approval of the change in the rate of structure for Hollywood and Highland, uh, located at 6508 uh, Hollywood Boulevard. And this is in regards to a prior motion that was done, uh, that was approved in 2011 uh, to go back to the council after four or five years and commission a study to see the effectivity and the flexibility and marketability of the market rate of Hollywood and Highland uh, Garage in the area. If you have uh, questions, I'm here too. Anything you want to add before I ask a few questions, Jay? No. Okay. So, um, 
the the process you have used on this one, I mean, I'll, honestly, I'll tell you th this, the the report and the recommendations on this feels a little bit like old DOT, uh, and we've got a a, a new DOT uh, that has been doing a lot of um, uh, thinking about how we do uh, parking management in the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we've got a parking reform working group that has a lot of ideas that are in the mix that are being uh, uh, moved forward in this committee. Uh, we've been moving forward with Express Park in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and, you know, we've got a, 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 a new mobility plan in place. And it, it just felt um, that, that we were just sort of repeating the process from last time around in, in our analysis. And uh, that there was some more um, uh, thinking that could uh, be done, uh, particularly regarding um, you know, what the demand will be for this lot and how uh, that uh, uh, sort of uh, intersects with uh, Express Park, which is coming right nearby here, I believe. We're going to be doing Express Park right nearby, right? Yes. Um, just curious, has Express Park ever been done in in a structure? So far as I've known, uh, there's none. And, and the reason for that is because the LA Express Park is basically uh, to provide uh, a turnover in on-street parking, which is for short-term parking. Mm -hmm. And the spillover goes to the long-term parking, which are the off-street facilities or off-street lots, surface lots, and the garages. In particular, with Hollywood and Highland, most of the clientele or the parking patrons that it has is for special events. And, and, and since it is an entertainment and tourist destination area, um, most, of the peop most of our clientele uh, comes to Hollywood and Highland either once or twice, either local or international tourists. So the movement in the, in the patrons is mostly to stay there to... Uh, be, re be able to take participation in um, the Walk of Fame, the Madame Tussauds, uh, the El Capitan, uh, the TCL, the Dolby Theaters, um, and that's where the bulk of its uh, transient parking uh, comes from. Uh, of course, the monthly parking is basically for the uh, employees of the center. If, if I, I, go, go ahead, Jay. If, if, I, if, I, uh, if I can add one thing, um, I think where the, uh, the coordination comes in is, is pricing. Because with on-street parking, if the pricing was so below compared to the off-street, then there's extra demand. And, you know, if you have a premium curb space, that's type of uh, sort of, you know, demand pattern that we don't want to see. And that's why I think the pricing of on-street versus off-street have to be uh, coordinated in a way that makes sense. And so, but in this particular report, uh, it's really about the lot itself. And as we bring in uh, Express Park for Hollywood, that's a time for us to actually adjust the uh, pricing of the on-street to sort of match what's happening on the off-street. Yeah, and this doesn't really anticipate that very well, was, was my point. I mean, w one of the things that con concerns me is I, I remember when, when, when Mr. Garcetti was running for mayor, uh, one of the things he used to talk about was his Parker app. Uh, and he talked about, and I'm not going to get the percentages right, but sure. uh, uh, that it was something like 15, 20 percent of the traffic in the Hollywood Highland area was from people circling, looking for a parking space. And if we're, we're, if we're setting a uniform rate uh, so that the, 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 the price for Tuesday morning at 10.30 a.m., is the same as it is for Friday night at 8 p.m. Um, that that seems to me as if that's going to be an artificially high price for Tuesday morning, and that's going to incentivize people driving around looking for parking as opposed to just going into parking, and therefore create more congestion, more pollution, less pedestrian safety. Yes, there there is some potential for that, but I think uh, if you look at the the limited amount of parking that's available curbside versus the demand that's you know coming to the area is such a disparity. And also, you have to look at the clientele, right? That's actually coming to the site. 
a lot of the folks are out-of-towners. They're visitors and tourists. Uh, and the immediate sort of thing is to look for the perhaps the cheaper curb space. But I think, uh, you know, in the end, there would be such a demand for, uh, you know, the parking lot itself. Uh, there'll be a natural tendency for people to, you know, just come to the site and, and, and use the facility. And I think the, uh, the amount of the change that we're talking about is incremental and it's over a longer period of time. It's not overnight and it's not as if the, the, uh, the dollar amounts are such that, you know, it's way more exorbitant than the other uh, options uh, in the area, other lot options. And so I think it's in keeping with uh, what's happening in the marketplace and this is just really a way to sort of uh, modernize the parking pricing structure in a way that uh, kind of seem to fit the area and not, not, not be behind the times. Um, but I understand your concern about the coordination. And I think when we get to that point where we have LAX Express Park program, you know, when it's uh, ready to be implemented, that's when we could try to work out such that, uh, you know, uh, that those programs could be better aligned. Uh, but that program isn't quite there yet, and therefore it had to be sort of done in, in the absence of that program. And to add to that, Council Member, um, looking at the occupancy and looking at the, the, the transient numbers in terms of time, um, we, Hollywood and Island still have uh, the validation program so that we can encourage short-time parkers, which is uh, a very small amount compared to, in, in fact, it's lower than the on-street pricing, which is $2 for, right now we're at $2 for two hours. And so that particular clientele or patrons, we're capturing that. And then, of course, for the uh, cinema, it's $2 for four hours. So we're, we're still going to continue that as part of the program. But the main uh, number of transient parker is between the three to about five hours stay in the garage, which are mostly you know, going around looking at the things that they can do around the area. Uh, what kind of outreach has been completed uh, or is anticipated to the monthly pass holders who are residents, employees, metro users, H&H, tenants, hotel, stuff like that? Uh, for we, under the reciprocal easement agreement, we do have automatic 300 spaces which is allocated for the hotel. So that's in place. Um, as far as the monthly parkers, which regards to employees uh, within the center and based on uh, an action taken by council way back was to extend it within, uh, I believe, 1,000 mile radius from the center to uh, open it up to other um, employees. We have an average of about 11 to 1,200 uh, monthly holders. For Metro, uh, uh, not at this time, uh, this facility is not a park and ride facility that is subsidized by Metro. So at this time, we don't offer uh, incentives or validation with Metro users. Let me ask the question this way. Of the monthly pass holders, how many of them know that we're considering raising the rates? Uh, and we, we will be, before we, con we, before we raise the rate, there is a minimum 30 days notification. We are the lowest monthly, uh, our rate is the lowest in the area. So we will provide them the, you know, the notification, both for residential and both for uh, the commercial users. Mr. Rue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I have the same concerns that you have, but let me ask it in a different way. Um, because I've been to Holland Highland several times, and maybe I'm not there at the most peak times, but every time I've been there, parking lot's always been lots of spaces available, pretty much empty. So, um, you know, what is the capacity of this lot, and what's the average level of utilization? Um, what, what I did is look at the first, the weekday, and the weekend occupancy. On the weekday occupancy, I divided it, or the occupancy is divided into three sectors, one from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, on the average, we are at 40%. Uh, and on PM peak, which is 1 p.m. to 10 p.m., we are at 56%. And on nighttime, which is 10 p.m. to 12 midnight, we are at 20.74. That particular percentage relates to mostly for Holly, um, nightclub goers. So that's, that's the percentage. On weekends, 
uh, on an AM peak, it's at 56.46%, and on 1 p.m. to 10 p.m., we are at 88.57%. Um, nighttime is only at 34.43%. Um, we have to take into consideration that depending on the events that's happening in Hollywood and Highland, those variates uh, simply because like if there's a big movie premiere, uh, there's Jimmy Kimmel show, uh, on summer events were practically always have high occupancy because besides the people that goes there during summertime uh, were also being used by uh, patrons from uh, that goes to the Hollywood Bowl so based on the numbers you just gave us I think it just reinforces what the chairman's talking about about having some sort of smarter way of um, uh, of, of doing a parking fee um, assessment um, because on weekdays the highest peak is 56% utilization, right. so you, the parking lot's half empty, pretty much. That's correct. So, and I mean, at other times, it's 80% empty. So, I, I don't see the justification in raising the rate. And, and, and I read the report, and I know that we're comparative to everybody else. We're the cheapest, and um, um, and, and we lowered the rates before due to other uh, uh, situations in the past. Um, but is there any other justifications? Um, besides the rationale for increasing costs because we're the cheapest than anyone else? Council member, the, the, the percentage is not because people don't go, uh, it's not because of, of the pricing. It's because of the activities uh, that is done. If we don't have the entertainment activities that's ongoing, our market, no matter what you do, will not go up. Uh, because the people that it serves or the patrons that it serve in the area are the people who goes into the entertainment and tourist area, which is the Hollywood and, uh, Hollywood and Highland Center. And compared to other des under areas where you have businesses uh, that uses uh, the garage, here it's mostly either tourists or uh, simple shoppers that are, are going there or attending the special events. So there's a, the dynamics of... Uh, the patrons is kind of different compared to other garages. You know, um, I, I don't know, Mr. Chair, I, I'm more for whatever we could do to reduce the congestion. I mean, even if it's free parking, if we let people know you could park here for free and, and because 20% of all traffic is caused by people looking for parking. So if people know that they could come and park here for a much cheaper price and it alleviates, because I have all the surrounding neighborhoods, and they're always complaining to me about the congestion. So anything we could do to reduce congestion, I know we need to, uh, we need to make some profit as well, but when, when our parking lot's pretty much empty most of the day, I mean, for the peak times, I, I don't mind the increase. That's why I'm, I, I love what you're saying about having a smarter way of struck pricing this out, but I couldn't see how, I mean, I know it's a nominal increase, but still. Well, in, it, in, it, in, in terms of, and this is something I think that they need to think about and, and come back to us on. Uh, I think there's more work to be done on this uh, along the lines of what Mr. Rue and I have been suggesting. But the, the thing I think we need to be careful about is if, if, if there's potentially, if there's no parking charge that disincentivizes people from using uh, Metro to get there. Uh, and then they park there and you get more neighborhood traffic. So you've got to find the sweet spot. Um, so what I'd like to do is ask you guys take another 30 days uh, and uh, consider for the future report uh, evaluating the facility's current parking demand, revenue, and annual budget, um, uh, uh, potential congestion impacts of a variety of rates, um, it, study the proposed rates, expected impact, parking demand, parking behavior, travel behavior, and um, Forecast ways to more strategically use pricing at this facility to support future mobility projects in the city's transportation and, and urban initiatives. And sort of as part of that, sort of think about how this intersects with Express Park nearby. Uh, if you need more than 30 days, that's fine. But uh, okay. Uh, okay. So we'll yeah. continue that for a little more work. Uh, thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, council members. <clears throat> and that brings us to item number three. Item number three is a Bond and Harris Dawson motion relative to directing the LADOT working with the city attorney to 
report on the current policy related to limiting the issuance of parking citations to one violation per vehicle per day to include the feasibility of implanting a graduated citation fine schedule. Uh, thank you. So before staff comes, uh, before staff comes up, um, I, we have a number of public speaker cards, so I'm going to ask the public to, to speak first, and then you can uh, sort of react to that. Uh, colleagues, I was the uh, author of this motion, and I put it in because we've been having in a couple parts of the city, one of in my district, uh, chronic problems with the city's inability to uh, enforce uh, oversized uh, vehicle, particularly uh, food trucks. Uh, uh, and we have a variety of types of food trucks in Los Angeles now. Uh, everything from the traditional construction site uh, 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 sandwich maker to Kogi and gourmet food trucks. And we've got a system now that, that, that hasn't been particularly effective at um, addressing the problem of some of these vehicles parking, sometimes in very difficult places at, at key intersections that are creating a public safety problem. And part of the problem is that um, DOT's practice and habit is to issue one seventy-three dollar ticket, um, and most folks, because a lot of these things are very profitable, particularly on the upper end, upper scale, um, and they just eat that seventy-three dollar cost as as part of doing business. And so we wanted to see if there can be a graduated system, or whether we can issue repeated uh, citations throughout the day. And just as an example. Um, in near Bundy and, and Shetland in my district, um, two car crashes have already occurred as a result of the problems created from a repeat offender that just won't move despite getting a ticket. And one crash involved um, a woman who was about eight and a half months pregnant. Uh, she was T-boned as she made a left-hand turn under Bundy because she was unable to see around the large food trucks illegally parked there. And it's become a real... Uh, public safety issue, issue. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a way we can fix that uh, by getting a little bit smarter about how we enforce and how often we issue tickets. So um, we'll hear from the departments in just a few minutes. We have uh, folks from a couple different parts of the city here uh, to speak. Uh, first three speakers are Nancy Friedman, uh, Erica Broido, and uh, Donald Keller. Can Erica go? Sure, Erica, feel free. All three of you can come up there at once. My name is Erica Broido. The problem that needs addressing is illegal parking by chronic offenders. In our case, two food trucks, but this is not about food trucks per se. Fines enforce parking regulations, and enforcement is for deterrence because violations harm people. A ticket is not a fee. It's a fine. The city is currently impotent to stop two food trucks on my street who accept their $73 ticket as a cost of doing business and continue to park there every day, seven hours a day, obstructing views of oncoming traffic on a busy street often used by emergency vehicles. There's been accidents. A pregnant woman, a second car accident, customers crossing the street facing near misses, screeching brakes, residents being literally unable to leave their driveways due to blocked views, all caused by two food truck vendors' willful disregard of the law. As a representative of my neighborhood and as a board member of the Brentwood Homeowners Association, I ask you to support this motion. Thank you. Nancy. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Friedman. I'm the um, chair emeritus of the Brentwood Community Council. I would like to um, read you a list of names of people who have tried to stop two food trucks from uh, parking and vending illegally in view of a posted city sign. Mike Bonin, CD11's council member, Sharon Shapiro, his senior field deputy, Maria Gray, the senior lead officer of the West LA Police Department, Tom Vriorel, uh, LADOT senior traffic advisor, Matt Geller, CEO of the Southern California Food Truck Association, the Department, Los Angeles Department of Health County, LADOT enforcement officer who was ticketing the truck every day and was determined to have the truck leave, neighbors on Rosemary Lane, neighbors on Bundy Drive, Brentwood Community Council, Brentwood Homeowners Association, Tina Rothstein, whose home they parked in over a year 
um, to the point where her lawn was dirt because of so much foot traffic. Um, LADOT should recognize the efficiency of a graduated fine for instances such as this. It was very dangerous. People were sent to the hospital because of uh, not being able to see around the trucks. And um, it won't happen very often, but it would be a good city thing to do. Thank you. BCC supports Mike's motion. Thank you. Mr. Keller. My name is Donald Keller. I'm a vice president of Brentwood Homeowners Association living on Kenter Avenue for 58 years. Not only are these food truck, lunch truck operators scoff laws, but they are most intent on their attention to this lack of attention to the signage, the posted signage. That purposeful intent to ignore the signage makes them guilty of intent to violate the law as passed by the Los Angeles City Council. This is the reason that we asked the city to examine the existing law and make this intent to violate the law more serious with much more additional penalties, fines, etc. BHA supports the motion by Honorable Councilman Mike Bonin. And thank you very much, Honorable Councilman and Mr. Chair. Mr. Keller, thank you. Uh, every time you refer to me, you say honorable. Uh, I don't even get that kind of treatment at home, so it's nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, we have three more uh, public speakers. Honorable Chairman, could I ask the residents a few questions? <laughs> um, Regarding public safety and what they've actually uh, Yes, observed. I believe this is helping you make the findings you need to yes. make. All right, yeah, please go ahead, ask questions. Uh, you've talked about the trampling of lawns and the dirt and the blight. Is, are they leaving trash at the locations as well, the people that are standing on those lawns for hours at a time? Have you noticed a, an increase in trash or... Plenty of trash, and something that this committee or anyone working for the city is unable to regulate. With regard to the dispensing of food for more than two hours from a vehicle, mm -hmm. the county health code says you need an Andy Gump and a place to wash your hands. Mm -hmm. But understanding that that's a health department issue, right. not, not within the purview of the city council. Now in and if I say honorable, that's just the vintage of my age. <laughs> in terms of you, you were better off when I thought you were, were you, when I thought you were sincere. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of public safety, have you yourself experienced trouble getting in, out of your driveways and not being able to see because of the trucks parked there? I have. I live three houses down from Shetland. They park just to the north of Shetland. Um, I l l literally have gotten in my car, if you have the photographs, that's from my driveway, mm -hmm. looked, not been able to leave at many times, and I have two choices. I either go back home or I ask a customer to go stop traffic with their hand. So basically you're in fear every time you have to back out of your driveway. Really scared. And is it you... Both concur well, with that as well. They, they attract a, a variety of customers, gardeners, construction workers, who just pull in in front of someone's driveway while they're going to get a sandwich. Now a big line queues up at the food truck, and nobody can get in or out of their driveway in that vicinity. Right, and I think part of the point is they're, they're parking right underneath a sign that says right. Right. not no. to be parking here. Yes, right. it's Indeed. an oversized vehicle right parked close to right. the during the hours that they're mm -hmm. forbidden to right. park. Right. This has nothing to do against food trucks. We love food <laughs> <No>. trucks. <laughs> this is a danger and it's a liability for the city and it's a, it's a small thing but it could happen anywhere and it just seems like if there was some way to stop it, it would be a good idea for the city to do so. And have you expressed your concerns to the food trucks? Ask them to move? That yes. They're, and I, what, they're, what's their reaction? They, no. I, I asked if, if they're not willing to move to just move slightly north so they're not on the blind curve, and they wouldn't do it. So they're just basically disregarding the signs and disregarding it, requests. Yes. yes. It's a very few people, but it's, an, it's a blatant disregard of the signs right in front of them. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, three more public speakers uh, from, uh, where did I put them? Uh, primarily from downtown, uh, Blair Beston, uh, Patty Berman, and John Holland.
Good afternoon, honorable council members. <laughs> <laughs> He's setting a precedent now. Um, anyone who's ever attended a historic core bid meeting knows that this comes up inadvertently each and every time. I don't know how it's uh, put into the conversation. Um, we support this motion and escalating fees. Um, it's become one of the number one complaints that we've also had from our constituents. Um, some have, some of the food trucks have become so emboldened that they um, have become a nightly fixture and they have regular operating hours as if they're a brick and mortar. Um, they dominate particular spots and um, they go to great lengths to do so. And they've even threatened some of the residents who have um, asked them to maybe move or rotate their hours or location. Um, and I'm also sorry to hear that via this motion that people have actually been involved in accidents. Um, that's obviously the worst case scenario. So I would just like to lend my support on behalf of the board and myself as a resident of downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patty Berman. I'm the president of the Downtown Neighborhood Council. We have not had a chance to uh, take a look at this, so I'm speaking for myself, but we will be looking at it. Uh, Everything that she has said about the historic core is true of so many of the neighborhoods in my territory. Because of the illegal parking, there are so many problems. There's the problem of trash on the sidewalks. We've had people slip on the trash and get hurt. Uh, the, there, there is such a boldness to some of these people, so, so much of a feeling of entitlement that there's no talking to them. If you go and you ask, where are you supposed to use the bathroom? Who's, how, where are you getting hot water to wash your hands while you're preparing food? They will tell you, hey, nobody cares and nobody's going to do anything about it. Here, here's the number of the uh, health department. Go ahead, call them. They don't care. Uh, it, the emboldenment is what makes it so terrible. And there are so many problems that we have. All of the things that have been discussed already. The, uh, the traffic issues, the trash issues, the fact that it, it hurts, hurts the throughway for pedestrians, all of these. I would like to thank both Mike Bonin and David Rue for bringing this to our attention. It's really important. Thank okay. you. Th thank you, Mr. Howland. Good afternoon. I'm John Howland with the Central City Association. CCA supports the motion to review the city's parking regulations, especially the prohibition on issuing more than one citation for a recurring violation. Parking spaces have time limits so that there is turnover, which means more customers for businesses in that area. Instead, there's a proliferation of food trucks parking in a spot, often directly in front of a restaurant all day. As said, a $73 parking ticket is much cheaper than paying rent and all the other costs that cities impose on brick and mortar operations. Add in that there are bad actors, as we've heard about, out there who ignore requests from local merchants to pick up trash, to control smoke or order, and odors or worse. In addition to the safety issues that have been discussed, uh, these full-day parkers, whether they're cars or truck, deny the city parking funds, cost local merchants and restaurants business because potential uh, customers can't find places to park. So we support the motion and we'll support changes to the city's parking regulations that prevent cars and or trucks from occupying the space well beyond the posted time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any more questions for these speakers? I, based on, on one observation that was made, uh, you said that you had heard that people have been threatened by some of these vendors. Can you elaborate on that? Um, felt threatened their public's, you know, their own personal safety. So, so a number of people came to you and told you that they had been? A handful of people, handful. but uh, with, a, with a particular vendor that is a, re a repeat offender in the area. Um, and, you know, I, I wasn't present, so I don't know how the dialogue happened. However, they felt threatened enough to reach out to me and ask me if there was something I could do to help them. Uh, when we bring I have also oh. heard these same complaints. Okay. When we bring this back, when the ordinance is completed, I would really appreciate it if you could get a hold of that person, have them come in, because that, that's pretty important, that the fact that residents are being threatened, it's a, that even raises the level of public safety. So I'd appreciate that if you could do that okay, for me. Thank, thank you. Thanks. And while, thank you to the public, uh, staff comes up, uh, staff can come up now. I just want to make clear what the purpose of this motion is, because I think there was sort of, um, some of the testimony was broader than what the solution is actually right. meant to do. Uh, this is not about doing anything to outlaw food trucks, anything further than the current regulations. This is about finding a better way to enforce the existing regulations. There are rules that the city has on the books that just aren't being enforced. We have folks parking in no parking zones uh, at intersections, uh, creating blind spots for folks. We have folks parking 
literally right underneath signs that say don't park here. And uh, because our system, our practice is a $73 ticket, it, it's cost of doing business, they stay there, creating the continued public safety problem of the intersection being blocked, the enforcement uh, uh, issue. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that there's really nothing in the citation that, that says to vendors that when you get the citation, not only do you need to pay the fine, but you're supposed to move. Uh, and so it's just become sort of an enforcement problem. So um, the, the, the motion itself had asked for uh, the, the department to sort of report on, on, on options. I know part of what we would need in order to revise the ordinance and fix it is to um, uh, establish the findings about the, the public uh, health and safety hazards. Uh, ha Mr. T City Attorney, has that been sufficiently established by this conversation, or do you need DOT to, to make a written report on that? We have the public testimony mm -hmm. now. If DO DOT can also supplement it, that's always helpful that they've made their own observations as well. Okay. Uh, we can DOT, supplement. We can supplement. Uh, Steve Ben Ellis from our staff um, worked on this matter. He actually went out to the location. He talked to the council office. He spoke to the officer that handles that beat. He's called around to various cities that have the same problem. And he's actually, in collaboration with the city attorney's office, have come up with a recommendation for amending the the, vehicle, the uh, Los Angeles Municipal Code to deal with this particular situation. So he's, he's going to go through that with you right now. Please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the, as you know, the current policy for enforcement of the mobile food vendors in the residential areas does not allow for multiple citations for the same violation on the same day at the same location. Um, however, there is a violation um, that's subject to graduated fines, uh, a graduated fine schedule, and multiple citations can be issued within a 12-month period. And it starts at $73 for the first violation, $123 for the second violation, and $173 for the third and subsequent violations. Uh, what the department would like to recommend is that the city attorney amend this uh, LAMC catering violation, which is 80.73B, 2F, to allow the issuance of multiple citations for the same violation if the vehicle remains at the same location after 30 minutes of receiving a citation. And that would be 30 minutes after every time they receive a citation. Uh, in addition, the Department of Transportation will request that conduit transportation solutions include language printed on these particular citations advising the possibility of multiple citations for noncompliance. So when they do receive their citation, it would be specific that if they do remain there an additional 30 minutes, they're subject to another and another and another. Once these items are created, a new enforcement practice um, will be established, and that will be our effort to go ahead and address, better address the mobile food vendors in the residential areas. Okay. Thank you. Colleagues, questions? Mr. <coughs> Mr. Wiesel. Uh, first, let me underscore some of the testimony that was brought by some of the residents from downtown LA. Our office has been grappling with this issue where food trucks go and we put up signs and do everything possible and we don't find a solution. I would call some of the business owners telling them, look, the problem's been solved. We have signs and everything's taken care of. And a few weeks later, same thing, um, they, because um, the food trucks are willing to take it, the citation as a cost of business. But uh, my question is this. The a municipal code you're referring to, would that apply to all vehicles or only food trucks? And if it only applies to food trucks, do we have a equal protection clause um, issue before us? There, uh, we have a specific ordinance dealing with food trucks, and it's state law allows us to have a specific ordinance dealing with food trucks. Okay, vending. so th that's the specific to food trucks and not yeah. all vehicles. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? So is there a way once the, um, the traffic officer issues a citation, is there a way to track whether it's the first citation of the day? Of the day? Mm -hmm. uh, probably not of the day because it needs to be downloaded. Correct. It, it, it's not in real time on the, handheld, yeah. on the handheld ticket device. So it would take a day before the information would be uploaded into Xerox's. So if you're ETA giving multiple device. citations a day to the same vendor or the same truck, 
why does it matter? Because they just increase the amount of, of fee they would, the fine would just increase. Yeah. There, it, the, as, it'll, council member, it'll be on an escalated scale under uh, 89.60 of the Los okay. Angeles Municipal Code. So they get the first citation. We'll know if they don't move the truck because the person is, the vendor is still with their vehicle. And it's within the first 30 minutes of issuing and, the first citation? And then each 30 minute increment that they don't move the truck, they'll get the second violation, which will be $123. If they stay, they're going to get a third violation after 30 minutes for 173. So if they want to spend five hundred dollars, so that, that traffic class. officer would have to stay there. Um, well, under the or, under the code section, and we're not going to change that in there. They have to move the vehicle at least a mile, and we're going to know if they stayed at the location. And certainly, the residents will let us know if they're still at the location. But the way the the law is currently written. They're required to move a mile from the location. They can return to the location, I believe, under the current ordinance, if they but wait more than six like minutes. But it doesn't appear like these folks that they're, that they're talking about in Mr. Bonin's district move at all, correct? No, and that's why, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the, the DOT I mean, they're required to move a mile, but it sounds to me, based on the testimony, that these two trucks don't refuse to move right. at all. Right. It's only a few of them. It's not well, it's the food trucks. Two, yeah. That's why after another 45 minutes, DOT right. can give them a second ticket, okay. then another one yeah. until they, 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 they move or decide the cost is too much. Have a thousand dollars in yeah. fines in one day. That's no longer doing the cost of doing business for them. They're going to move their trucks. Right. Okay. So then, my, my recommendation would be that the uh, the, the the committee uh, recommend to the full council that the count council request that uh, city attorney. Um, <laughs> Uh, draft the revised ordinance um, 80.73 uh, as outlined uh, by DOT in their testimony uh, and uh, work with uh, DOT to make the appropriate findings. Yes. That's sufficient? Okay. Uh, that then will be the direction of the committee. Thank you very much and thank you to everybody who came down to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. That brings us to item number four. Item number four is a DOT report in response to a Bon and Rue motion relative to directing DOT and the CAO to report in regards to the existing parking citation fine schedule and the feasibility of implementing a tiered parking citation fine structure and variable citation amounts in areas of the city with performance-based pricing and proposed community assistance parking program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Mayer, and I'm going to be speaking on behalf of LA DOT on item four. Please excuse my voice. I've been losing it. Um, this item was previously introduced to the T Committee on June 22, 2016. CAP stands for the Community Assistance Parking Program, and it would allow homeless individuals to do community service in lieu of paying for parking citations. We've also met in front of the Homeless Strategy Committee before in August of 2016. We have legal authority to do this program under the California Vehicle Code, Section 240215, Subsection 7. And in order to meet the requirements of our program, each individual would have to qualify under Title 42 of the Public Health and Welfare Code. Basically, how this program would work is that a homeless individual would receive a citation, they would walk into a service provider agency, and they would begin their enrollment process. We would have to approve them, make sure that they qualify for our program, and then they would be entered into the CES system or coordinated entry system to make sure that we're tracking who's in our program, who defaults on the program, and who completes it. We would also be tracking them within our own program in LADOT through the ETEM system. And if they complete their service, then they would have their citations dismissed and they'd be able to go to the DMV and renew their registration. If they do not have their citations dismissed, um, if they don't complete their service, they would be eligible for up to two contracts per year. And each contract is up to $1,500 worth of citations. We're also working on a, um, a schedule so that if they don't complete their citation, we're going to round the number so that they do get the credit for the amount that they've done. We've done a number of outreach services. Um, we've, we've done a lot of outreach for this program. I've uh, met with almost all 15 <coughs> of the council district offices in person. I've sat down with the homeless liaisons there and answered any of their questions. And if I haven't met with them in person, then I have by phone or by email. I've also worked with 
we have worked, Wayne Garcia and I have worked with LASA, we've presented on our program, we've worked with the homeless engagement and response team with the city attorney's office, or HART. They've provided us much guidance and I want to thank them for that. Um, they have also helped us with a service provider list that's also, that are already connected with the CES program in LASA. Um, we've worked with the LA Mayor's Office as well, with the LAPD HOPE program, and with several service providers. In terms of the type of community service that they would be doing, we're taking in mind that these homeless individuals, some of them are mentally disabled and physically disabled. And so we're counting a type of social services as their community service. In other words, rehabilitation programs and the services that they really need would also be able to count as their community service. We don't have um, our own statistics for this program since it isn't up and running yet, but we have extrapolated statistics from LASA showing that as of 2016, the homeless count observed uh, 3,908 vehicles used as dwellings. Um, we anticipate that the vehicles being used as dwellings, the registered owners, will be coming into our program, um, even though not all of them will. Um, and then as, as soon as we're in place or up and running, we're going to be running both quantitative and qualitative um, statistics to gather more information to present to the council members. We have developed our scale of how many hours they should do for the amount done based on uh, studying the San Francisco Metropolitan Agency program already in place that's similar that allows for community service for homeless individuals, as well as San Diego, Simi Valley, and other programs already in place in California. But we have adjusted the scale of hours due for the total amount due based on feedback from these meetings. We wanted um, not an overly punitive um, a program for them, and we're taking in mind the working poor and the elderly and the, and the physically and mentally disabled as well. When it comes to safe parking, um, we are keeping this in mind with our program. Uh, what we're going to do as of now is with the service providers we're working with, we're going to be providing them maps of the safe parking in the area in order for them to understand um, the connection of the homeless individuals that could apply to our program. Um, and also, we're, we're hoping that it will be a better way to track who can come into our program as well and bridge the gap between who's in CES and who is still not there but part of our program. So a better way of tracking the individuals that live in their vehicles. And we're also currently working with the city attorney's office um, in terms of a, a forgiveness a plan or a fine reduction plan for homeless individuals that really need it. But right now we are, we are working and talking with them and we're going to continue doing that to develop something to help them. We're asking for no funding at this time, and in the future, um, depending on the success of our program, we're going to consider expanding the population that's served. I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Go ahead. Um, I have several questions. So sure. say an individual has multiple citations. Um, if an individual begins um, the program but doesn't complete it, will the, the citation still stand? It depends on how many hours they do. Um, what's, the, there, what's the minimum requirement? So we have a scale um, listed as part of the agenda. But basically, if they don't complete their hours, they're eligible to come back. And we will still count their hours in that year. They're afforded two contracts per year. In each contract, um, it can be up to $1,500 due. So we would credit them for the amount that they have done. And then we would put them in a separate contract for the rest. How many times can that person restart the program? As many times as they can. Is there a limit on how many applicants can participate in the program at once? No. No, there there's no problem. limit on the number of applicants. And I know you mentioned you didn't have a budget request, but do you anticipate in the future in the that future, you're going to have to need some sort of funding to implement the program? From what we've learned, um, as the program grows, then it's possible that we will need it. Do you have a figure? We, we don't have a figure at this time. Uh, like, for example, when we looked at San Francisco's model, theirs is so big that they actually contract this out mm -hmm. for someone to manage this. Um, for our how program... Much, how much do they, does it cost the city of San Francisco? Uh, I don't have that figure. Um, but for our program right now, um, it's just Teresa and I. And, it's myself, and Teresa's actually, uh, she's a part-time part -time employee of ours. Uh, she's a law student at UCLA. And so her and I will be running this program for now until we see you know, how, the success, how many 
applicants that we get. And if we need additional funding, then definitely we would request that. But you don't anticipate asking for funding in this year, in this new fiscal year? No, ma'am. Uh, you indicated it would be a pilot program. Uh, is there a geographic area in which the pilot will operate, or uh, what, what are the parameters of the pilot? It's all of the city of Los Angeles, and um, and there are several service providers within the city that are going to be enrolling the homeless individuals, so that's the geography of the program. So it's not specific to a service provider area or anything no, like that? No, as of right now, it's not. Would it be easier? to limit it to a service provider area where you're dealing with one universe and one network of service providers, given the limited resources that you have in running the program? It, it may be easier, but um, based on our experience over the past year since the word got out that we're doing this, we're finding that we're getting requests from all over the city. Sure. So um, we want to work the entire city. And um, I have additional staff members within my division who I'm going to you know, train along with Teresa to help me with this program and help us get it established and help us do the outreach and all that within my own staff. Um, yes, uh, in answer to your question, it would be easier, but because these, quest these requests are coming from all over the city right now, um, and we're just taking names and numbers, we'd, we'd like to give it our best effort to, you know, try and serve the whole, the entire city. So l let me just talk through this a little bit, because I, I, I can see... Uh, uh, various different people wanting to, to take advantage of this. And uh, I know firsthand of an example that would be perfect for this. I mean, the city attorney has had a very successful uh, homeless court or homeless citation clinic going on. I know of a, a woman in my district who was living with her children in an RV uh, and uh, was uh, repeatedly ticketed and uh, eventually the vehicle was impounded and she and her children wound up uh, living on the street uh, uh, in an alley uh, in Venice. And uh, you know, that's a situation under which DCFS will take children away, break up a family, uh, and our policies made that situation worse. Presumably this helps with that. The other situation is uh, and I'm sure a uh, number of my colleagues have have different but similar situations. Uh, representing a coastal area, I get folks who will, uh, you know, they'll travel around and they'll uh, come from Seattle and they'll uh, hang out in Santa Barbara and then they'll come down to Venice and uh, they're not uh, really homeless, certainly not in the same way that the, the woman with young children described. Uh, <coughs> Uh, how, how how does this program make a distinction between her and the traveler? So we're going to look at everyone on a case-by-case -case basis. If they're just traveling, then that's different from someone in a transitory living situation, living out of their car all the time. Um, and so we're going to be paying close attention to the details of each case, and they would have to be homeless and receive a citation in the city of Los Angeles to qualify. So I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at is, because I'm not talking about someone who's just visiting Los Angeles for two okay. weeks. We're talking about someone who has adopted a, a, a sort of lifestyle choice that they are sort of a modern day vagabond. Uh, I've got a number of situations like that. Uh, you know, number of folks who are, you know, with plates from out of state and stuff like that. Um, but they're not here for a couple of weeks. I mean, they're here for a couple of years, and they may be in Venice uh, one week. They may be in San Pedro another week. They might be, uh, uh, you know, in Pacific Palisades uh, another week. But they're in Los Angeles long term. Uh, it is part of the requirement here that you're enrolled in services in some way. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because I think that's the, the that's the distinction. Okay. Yes, there's an application process, mm -hmm. and they have to be certified by the service agency as homeless uh, mm -hmm. before they can enter into our program. And they've had to have completed the VI SPDAT. Correct. Okay. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, the VI SPDAT is not a short and easy process. It's an exhaustive questionnaire the service providers use. It takes a couple hours often. It's a very detailed questionnaire. So it someone who's just sort of floating around, they're probably not going to have completed the SPDAT 
and be enrolled and registered with an agency. Okay. Yes, sir. That, that gives me a lot of comfort that it's that there's a sort of. That's why we're working with the service provider so that they can do that. I just re uh, recalled something I watched on the news last night. There was a police officer, I believe it was a West Valley, who came across a homeless man that was living in his car but had expired tags. Mm -hmm. And he actually raised money among some of the officers to pay for his tags because he was being basically evicted from a parking lot that he was staying in. But how does that, how do we sort that out as well? Because you have, you have citations, parking tickets that you're incurring, but on top of that, you probably have expired tags as well. So have we come across that situation? Um, is this program prepared to deal with that as well? Um, we, we, that was a really compelling, I don't know if we saw it, Mike, on the news last night, I but it was, yeah, um, but, yeah a police that officer, a it was out in, I want to say it was West Hills, Canoga Park area. Um, and the police officer just took it upon himself to raise the money to pay for his tags or else his car was could probably get impounded for expired tags. But it just complicates things even further for someone who's living in his car, so his or her car. So have you come across that issue? What yeah, do you prefer to do with that? And that's actually a big reason for this program is because a homeless individual with expired tabs continues to get expired tabs citations. Correct. And then once they get five or more, that's yeah, then they, then they become a scoff law. Then they're eligible for tow. And then that's when it gets really sticky because then their vehicle's towed, they lose their home, the official police garages, they don't waive any types of fees whatsoever. So that's when we, re we have a real big problem. So what we're trying to do is get these people into the community service program up front where they could do community service for their expired tabs citation or for any citations they have on the books so they could clear the record to but zero it's only to clear our, our 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 city citation it's not necessarily to deal with the expired tag that's, no but they need one of that, that that's a state issue yeah they that's need to pay the state or the dmv for those tags correct the renewal yes. of your tags you're not dealing with any of that no no we'll cl clear the citation record to zero and then if they have some sort of assistance to a friend relative whoever to you still to, to, to pay their vehicle registration the and then two they can register. Things, two separate things. Yeah. So last night, what I saw, this, this person couldn't move his car off the p private parking lot because he had expired tags. And if he moved the vehicle, he was probably going to be faced with citations for having expired tags. Correct. So there's a whole complicated mess. Yeah. Another thing that we're working on is on a vehicle sticker um, to put on the vehicle so that officers know that they're already enrolled in our program so that they don't keep on issuing the same the citation same repeatedly. And we're also going to be tracking them within our own computer systems that they are already enrolled. Mr. Roop? Um, just a quick question. So based on that, so this people will qualify for this program just for parking citations or yep. other things like expired tags would not count? So um, I mean, tickets for expired tags. An expired tab is a citation. Um, but it's also something that you need to resolve with the DMV. So they can get a citation for an expired tab. But yes, there are only parking citations that are covered within this program. Traffic citations are not involved in this program. That's with the heart clinic. And do you know what the average uh, ticket uh, amount is for these individuals we're talking about? We've First helped time. all ranges. <laughs> all, all ranges, but, you know, the majority may get... Um, Expired meters, just parking at a meter for a long time or overnight, you know, it's a like six, 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 bucks, yeah, right? $63. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just then, wondering. then once it goes into penalties, it doubles. Uh -huh. And then there's a $25 fee added. Then there's a $27 special collections fee. For, so now you're in like the $150 range. You know, so I'm wondering how you came up with a $1,500 figure because you said it's up to $1,500 and you could do it twice. So yeah, so 3, we came up with it by studying the other programs already in place um, from San Francisco, San Diego, Simi Valley, and other programs within the state of California. Mm -hmm. So that's, we, we modeled our program after those programs, and we're trying to make it inclusive enough so that they don't have to do, come back two times in one year. They can just take care of all of it in one contract. So once, once the program gets started, I'd love a report back just to see what the average Absolutely. ticket amount is. Well, I'll take note of that. Thank you. All right, we have uh, three uh, public comment cards. Uh, staff could make room for Omid Tabai. Uh, Tabai? How do you pronounce it? Tabai. Tabai? Yes, sir. Uh, AP Pishavar and uh, uh, Charlie Ariolo. Please go ahead, sir. 
if you don't mind, actually. Sure. Okay. I'm A.P. Pishvar. Um, uh, I was a lawyer for 22 years, moved to L.A. to join a tech company a couple of years ago. Um, my son passed away in an um, airplane crash, so we were um, in, in that void. We were taking some of our friends and colleagues to go to Skid Row to feed the homeless and clean up the streets. Uh, every six months we do that, and we're going to keep doing that. Um, last time uh, when we did that, we were talking, it was a lot of... Uh, happened to be a lot of lawyers who volunteered to come clean up. And we said, you know, is there something else we can do more? Uh, and the idea came up to uh, start a pro bono clinic for the homeless on Skid Row. Uh, we reached out to the LA Mission, and we have a very um, positive uh, relationship with them. They, they give us the uh, space, and we have a partnership with them. Um, we just launched the clinic on, on the 9th, this past Monday. Uh, we saw 24 um, of their uh, students there who are in their program, uh, two or three steps into the recovery process. And this uh, parking issue is one of the recurring issues that, that we saw. And I would um, defer to Omi to discuss that further. Thank you. And my condolences on your loss, sir. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Um, so to build on what my colleague has said, as he said, uh, this past Monday, um, the Abraham H. Pishavar II Pro Bono Clinic was held. We saw over 24 potential clients. Um, and as my colleague also stated, this parking issue is a large issue. The, um, we distributed a significant amount of information on the homeless court program, which is incredibly helpful um, and is very promising. These are people that are working very hard to change their lives. Um, and have um, entered into a new phase to do so and very much feel that, um, you know, they're trying to put their past behind them. And so this parking citation issue um, we saw come up pretty significantly in almost um, every case. Um, uh, uh, so we support the general intent of this, um, of this initiative. There are some, um, you know, uh, sticking points that we would like to address you know, through further discussion. But we do support the general intent of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Charlie. Good afternoon. Uh, Charlie Arreola with the City Controller's Office. Thank you very much, uh, committee members, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, and thank you, Council Member Bonin, uh, for your leadership on the issue of parking reform. Here, uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of parking reductions considered by this committee. With the proposed $245 million budget shortfall, the controller recommends you act with caution when considering parking fine reductions. We hope there is a full deliberation of smart technologies and the other recommendations outlined in our letter that you have received. Uh, the clerk should have passed it out. Oh, I saw some. A letter, a letter yes. Uh, as well as uh, by uh, Council Member Bonin uh, before any fine reductions are approved. Uh, lastly, we hope you visit our website, uh, parking at propertypanel.la, uh, to find information about where parking uh, tickets are issued, most frequent uh, tickets issued, and much more. Thanks. Um, question, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the controller's letter and, and report addresses sort of the whole rubric of parking reform, uh, all the initiatives that the parking reform working group has recommended, things that Correct. are that are that are in this committee fairly regularly. The the item we're discussing right now is this is this spe specific pilot program uh, for people who are homeless. Um, by forgiving some of the, the fines, presumably that has the impact you warn of. Are, are you saying that the controller is urging us not to approve this pilot This program? is relevant to parking fines in general. So uh, this is, uh, it may, may have been my mistake with uh, filing with the clerk for the item. Okay. All right. And okay. This Thank this you. This is a general comment. This is not correct. about right. this particular program. Correct. Correct. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so... Um, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, so the recommendation from the uh, department is uh, seeking um, for the council to direct DOT to establish uh, the pilot program as outlined and discussed. Um, uh, my recommendation is the committee approve that recommendation uh, with the provision that there be a uh, report back to the homeless and Homelessness and Poverty Committee uh, in six months uh, and that uh, during that period of time, if issues come up, uh, please share them earlier with uh, this committee and Homelessness and Poverty. Uh, and um, uh, I'd also recommend that uh, DOT stay in contact with 
the uh, city attorney's uh, 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 ticket clinic, the homelessness court, and some of the, the pro bono providers here to get feedback uh, as you go along and you're, you're sort of doing your, your, your trial and error. We're, we're tied with heart. We're going to be working with them. When do you intend, I should have asked this earlier, when do you intend to launch the program? Uh, you're going to report back to, the, uh, your, Mr. Chair, you're saying to report back to the Homeless Committee. Uh, when is the program going to take effect? Well, the vehicle code requires that we have approval by the governing body of the city, which is the city council. So once the city council gives us the approval, then we can basically start the next day. So you're sending this report to the Homeless Committee in, in six months? Uh, so when is it coming? It's already no, referred it was, it was, to committee it was, it was, right now. It's already been jointly referred to homeless okay. and poverty. Just saying that they should Report be giving the progress that. reports to So when to did them. they go to council? We don't know yet since it hasn't gone to the homeless committee for consideration. Oh, they haven't heard the item. Right. No, they have not heard it yet. We've, we've already been in front of the homeless strategy committee in August of 2016. I want to get a sense I actually, of when the actual program is going to take, is going to get off the ground. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, so we go from here to the homelessness and poverty committee, which is separate from the homelessness strategy committee. Actually, uh, There's just account. too many committees. <laughs> <laughs> we can't make it any more complicated. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. So we have any idea? Is it spring? Are you shooting for spring, early summer? What are we talking no, about? We're, we're shooting for as soon as we can get council approval. We're shooting for the next day. We're, we're ready to go. Because we have a list of people waiting that have been asking. And we've yeah, been trying to Early help March? As soon as possible. I would think so. Yeah. I mean, if homelessness and poverty schedules it quickly and that goes right to council, okay. then yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, let me, uh, in particular, uh, thank, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot your name already. Teresa Mayer. <coughs> Say that again? It's Teresa in Spanish, so Teresa, and then Mayer is my last ah, name. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for your work on this. I know you're a half-time employee. Uh, you're also a student at, at UCLA Law. Uh, I love the fact that we... Uh, have the ability through uh, part-time workers to get this kind of passion and expertise, and I want to thank you for working on it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, on item number five, uh, I was going to recommend a continuance on that item uh, for 60 days, and that brings us to item number six. Item number six, the DOT report relative to the city's accessible parking zone program. Yeah, he left it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, hold on just a second. If uh, those of you who are done with matters before this committee uh, could leave the room uh, or uh, quiet the conversations in the back so that uh, we can hear the remaining item. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, council members. Varej Jaroyan with the Transportation Department. Um, just for your information, let me, I'll uh, let the others introduce themselves. Luis Mata, I'm an ADA coordinator for the Department of Disability. Angela Kaufman, ADA compliance officer for the City of LA, housed in the Department on Disability. Mm -hmm. And Crystal Killian with the Department of Transportation. So in a prior council uh, action, council directed the Departments of Transportation, uh, Public Works, both Bureau of Engineering and Street Services, and the Department on Disability, or DOD, to report back on a comprehensive program to reestablish the blue curb uh, program or, or the uh, accessible parking zone. Yes. And uh, the, uh, over the last several months, um, we went back and, and, uh, and looked at the new requirements that uh, have been placed by uh, the uh, federal and the state uh, guidelines. Um, Actually, let me back up here for a second. So for, for many years, uh, DOT used to receive requests from constituents for a blue curb. And we used to 
uh, have engineers go out, investigate the request, and uh, if everything checks out, uh, then the department would issue work orders to install a blue curb in front of the constituent's residence. So it wasn't until about 2010 where the program was um, put on hold because of budget cuts. Um, in 2012, when we went, when we went back to reestablish the program, we came across these new guidelines by um, uh, federal highways and, and ADA and, and uh, the state. Basically, the new guidelines require that any blue curb installed by any public agency needs to be accessed by a, a wheelchair ramp. So if we have a request for a blue curb mid-block, then we need to install a curb ramp mid-block in front of the residence uh, address. The guidelines went further and said, and, and put the detailed uh, specifications for the ramp that basically said the ramp needs to be 20 feet long and 14, you need 14 feet of sidewalk because we need to set the curb back uh, by five feet, have five feet wide uh, ramp itself, that's 10, and then four feet for remaining sidewalk, that's 14. And, and the rules are very, very rigid in that regard. Uh, most city sidewalks are between eight and 10 feet. Rarely there is a 14 foot sidewalk. The guidelines also said that if uh, you don't have the 14-foot sidewalk, then you can install the blue curb at the beginning of the block and utilize the existing corner ramp uh, as an, a way of accessing the, the blue curb. So as much as we wanted to come up with a program with dollar amount and the cost and so on, it really becomes difficult because the price range could be anywhere from just simply painting the curb blue to hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to build a mid-block ramp, relocate street lights, re take down trees, relocate utility boxes and what have you so that we can build this new ramp. So, the, 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 in the report before you, what we wanted to do in, in consensus among the various uh, departments here is to at least come up with a, uh, a somewhat policy on where do we want to install this ramp. Our recommendation is that any blue curb installed uh, will be, or newly authorized, will be at the beginning of the block utilizing the corner ramp that way we can minimize the cost of installation and hopefully we can speed up the installation. Um, the, um, right now at DOT we have about 300 pending requests for blue curb. Uh, DOD, I'm, I'm told that we have about 1,100 requests. So we, as phase one, we wanted to go back, reassess these requests, see where they fall within the, the new policy um, and, and go from there, and then we can have a better idea as to uh, whether uh, uh, requesters will continue to uh, uh, need or, or uh, continue with their request if the blue curb is not in front of their uh, address. I'll stop there and, and see if you have any questions. I mean, it's... <laughs> Do you know how many requests you anticipate to process through the end of the year? Through the end of fiscal year? Um, oh, it's, it's hard to say. It's, we have about 300 now. We, we know we have 75 of them that are at the corner address. So we know we have at least 75 that we can uh, okay. investigate Im immediately. The, 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 the other... But you currently have 30, 300 requests. 300 requests with 1,100 at, at Department of Disability. So we have about 1,400 pending requests. Well, we don't know if we have 1,400. I'm sorry? Sorry, say that again? We don't know if we have 1,400. Correct. We know there's a minimum of 300. Well, we, we know there's a minimum of 1,100. Well, those 1,100, we don't know how many are duplicate requests. Okay. But there's only, you have 300 in your office, and there's another 1,100 pending in 
No, it, uh, there are there are in two departments. Disability has uh, department of disability has 11, received 1,100 right. requests. Transportation has 300. So the total is so you up. You can't you can't go and check to see and make sure you don't have. We are going to be working. We will be working on that, yes. but we don't have DOD's list yet, and so we have not reviewed it to see what that final number is. So, as Mr. Weezer reminded me before he left, mm -hmm. at our last meeting, the direction was given um, to the departments to consolidate the yeah. two lists, look for duplicates, see which ones are still current, and stuff like that. What's the status of the consolidation? That was a few months ago. Yeah, well, like October. Yeah, um, we, we have we have established a new way, uh, and and um, the 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 to receive the new request, we have created a new item on the my LADOT request. But yes, we we uh, we have not uh, focused. We we have not merged the two lists together. And, and also there is a question of possibly consolidating all of these requests with the um, uh, uh, Bureau of Public Works because there is um, relationships with their sidewalk repair program and they have still yet a different system. And so we're looking at temporary systems and long-term systems. So since August or October, whenever we gave the direction, nothing has happened on the consolidation yet? It's not that nothing's happened. We have decided that we'd like the intake to be through the MyLADOT system. But how many of those requests have actually gone into the MyLADOT My system, we don't know. Well, it how sounds like... Time, I mean, how much time realistically would it take to just compare uh, 1,100 address lists and 300 address lists? I mean, how complicated is that? It, it's not the complexity. DOD has days? told me that they should be getting me the list next week. And so I think maybe by the time this goes to full just council, care, we'll have a better number. Item. I mean, should that be something that would they report back next time they come back to us? Because yeah. If direction was given, and well, Mr. Weiser was frustrated yes. with the fact that this has not been done. So we, we need to have that consolidation. Happen. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a couple right. of recommendations. But one of them, I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what formats the different lists are in. Uh, but how old are these lists, first of all? Our 300 locations are from the year of 2016. Okay, they're all fairly new. Yes. How old are the 1,100 that DOD has? We uh, are going to be submitting um, our listing for last year. Okay. We, have, the, the, the uh, question... we have other uh, requests that have come in that came in pre-2016. Of the 1,100, how far back does that go? Um, we're looking at uh, maybe February, April of last year. So they're, they're all fairly current. I'm sorry? These are all new. Of last year? Yes. They're all within the past year. They're, they're all logged within the past year, but they may be repeat requesters from years prior because our department has actually um, asked constituents to call us back to get updates. Okay, well that so, clarifies part of it. So one of my concerns of was it. were there some on the 1100 where the person who made the request doesn't live there because it was eight years ago. So that's not right. something. That and, and actually, even the 300, there well, might be... Me, wait, wait, wait. Before no. you, let, no, me no, just, no, no. let me just get a, get a different... Yeah. So there's not a case of old requests where the person may have moved or passed on or... It's possible since we're now January of 2017 that those that came in... Right, but they're I mean, in the past. It would have happened within last year. So Not all the individuals that prior that had requested it prior are actually on last year's list. Are, are so. they logged by address? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. is consolidating the lists more complicated than merging two Excel spreadsheets or two Google Docs with the same fields and then just deduping it? I am estimating that is what's going to occur, and as soon as I get that list, I will probably spend a day or two deleting duplicate locations. Okay. All right. Um, so just to give folks, folks may have more questions, but sort of the direction that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we go in is um, to um, uh, direct DOT, DOD, BOE, BSS, 
to, to start the phase one of the APZ um, with the new federal and state requirements uh, to be incorporated into the city sidewalk repair program. Two, to uh, authorize DOT to generally restrict the installation of the APZs uh, to the beginning of a block and designate um, that parking space for public benefit to serve the entire block. Instruct staff to immediately begin, immediately, immediately begin an evaluation of the existing uh, requests from both departments, consolidate, dedupe, um, uh, and then look at not just what the list is, whether it's 300, 1100, 1400, or whatever number, but to look at them for eligibility, feasibility, prioritization, and construction, um, uh, and that any new requests received after January 20, 2016 get initial review and screening through the single intake process that you've been discussing. Um, and report in 180 days with a status on the existing public requests, the number of APZs installed, new public requests, and uh, the inevitable recommendations on how to improve the program. And finally, advise DOT to integrate the APZ site investigation into the city's curb inventory that will take place as part of the city's code the curb effort so that the quantity of blue curb spaces can be determined. Mr. Chairman. Um, should that be January 20, 2017, not yes. 20, no, okay, 16. thank you. I did that on I my think I wrote 16. Uh, daycare payment for my son. <laughs> We're only 11 days in, it's okay. Excuse me, okay, so, so um, I had another question. Yeah, go for it. So as we prepare, as we prepare next year's budget, so what resources do you anticipate asking for for next year and how many of these requests can be processed in a full fiscal year? Do we have mm -hmm. any idea? So this is why the consolidation is so important, so you can figure out how to pay for this. Yep. So what, what we said in the report, we DOT said that because we, uh, this is a, a function that we used to do before, we, we can do it still within the existing district operations staff. Um, I know that Department on Disability have requested two positions in the new budget year. For the this coming year, or was it supposed to be for this? Well, 18. Story? For the program, I, so we requested as, as what moves forward, our staffing is not up to speed to be able to handle right. the influx along with so what's going on. So the two positions that are being mentioned, is that for this current year or for next fiscal year? If it's possible to get them for this current year, we would like some assistance. It's, it's a lot of requests and eligibility. So and was it in this year's budget or? It wasn't because we were we held it off because of it going through council. Um, I believe it was submitted as part of the next year's budget with the anticipation of what may be coming out of council. And to put a sobering note on this, um, well, as we were discussing in budget and finance committee of the day, there's going to be a recommendation to the full council that uh, there be no new funding allocated for anything for the remainder of this year's budget, no new programs that they'd be rolled into right. um, to next year's budget. Is that right, Mr. Hirano? I'm sorry. It, I, I, I don't let a single committee meeting go by without uh, teasing Mr. Hirano in some manner or fashion. Uh, you, no, I, I, I kind of uh, grasp because um, I've been dealing a lot with a sidewalk program. Our staff what we had to do is shift staff around and then continue for staff to, to continue doing their regular work and, and do the sidewalk program. Now we have the blue curve program and everybody's going like, well, and that's why, you know, we, we asked as, as we proceeded with these committee meetings to ask for additional staff because it, it, it'd be uh, impossible to do it. We, we not only take names of people, and addresses, phone numbers, but we also talk to them about what it, what is it, why is it that you're asking for a blue curve program, for the blue curve, and it takes 
you know, some time to do that. I don't, I don't think you'll find anybody on this committee or on the Budget and Finance Committee who isn't uh, very eager to give you the resources yeah. to do that. We need to find a way to get our city departments to uh, get some our liability costs in line so we stop paying out uh, tens of millions of dollars every year and wasting the taxpayers' money. Um, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Chen, Bureau of Engineering. I just want to make a point on one of the recommendations. I apologize that the recommendations were just changed recently. I didn't get to see the latest version. But the, I think number I think two is that, that talks about, or maybe one, I don't have the number here, but it's the one that talks about putting this as part of the sidewalk repair program. Um, I think at this point I, I'd be more comfortable just saying that we will wait for the phase one uh, to, to basically assess what, you know, the, the volume of requests that we receive. Um, and it may be part of the sidewalk repair program, but at this point I, I wouldn't know that it necessarily would have to be part of the program. Huh? So what I'm saying is that right now it says the recommendation is to put this as part of the sidewalk repair program. Let me go uh -huh. back to the uh, yeah. document. Um, direct, the, direct the departments to initiate phase one of APZ right. uh, with the new federal and state requirements to be incorporated into the city sidewalk repair program. Correct. Yes. And what I'm saying is that it could be part of the sidewalk repair program, <laughs> repair program but um, at this point we don't know how much volume and the, the size of the, the, uh, the actual program will be. Um, and it's, if the thought is that we will not be getting more resources uh, to do this, that's just the, uh, something I'd rather leave open to say we will address it at that time to determine what would be the but best it, it, way. But it's not saying that this is the, the first and only thing the sidewalk repair program does. No, no, no. Well, yeah, but I guess I'm saying under the, under the blanket of sidewalk repair program um, that I'd feel more comfortable not having to say that it's part of the program right now. I'd feel uncomfortable not having it part of okay. the. Okay. Um, I think. I mean, I, I'm. I, well, we're 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 actually yeah. going to start repairing our sidewalks right. for the for the first time, you know, since, well, any of us on this committee were born, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, to to not be thinking about this issue as we launch that just seems a little. No, we would we would address this as as an issue. Um, it, I guess. That's where you pay for it. That's where the money. Well, if, if it's if it's going to be part of the if there's no additional funding, it's going to be part of the site of repair program. I guess there's no uh, kind of what um, Mr. Mato was saying earlier that there's no we, we haven't addressed how we're going to prioritize those locations, um, how it's going to fall under the uh, the Willits terms and all that. I think that's something that we I haven't really uh, understood that at this point. Maybe maybe David could speak to that. But Council Member and David Hirano with the Office of the CAO. Um, we're in agreement with your position, um, with great respect that we have for, for Mr. Chen. Um, we do not think that the implementation of this program is possible without using the resources that are currently allocated by the Council Mayor to the Sidewalk Repair Program. Beyond that, we also think that there is an extremely logical nexus between the two programs and significant overlap in the work. There's also an overlap in the constituency that we're serving both with the sidewalk repair program as um, organized under the Willett Settlement and the Blue Curb program. Both are constituents that are disabled and need access um, and need a, free, need a path of travel in order to achieve that access. And that path of travel is achievable through the repair of the sidewalks, uh, a whole block face of sidewalks adjacent to the residence, plus the installation of curb ramps. The only thing that is um, currently in the, not funded in the budget that we can identify would be any extra outreach component that the Department of Disability is referring to, um, any extra quantities of blue paint the Department of Transportation needs, and maybe a few extra signs here and there. But that's about it. So I think in, in the reports back that you're asking for, those are the kinds of things that we would expect them to quantify and determine whether we need any additional allocations for. Um, but as of right now, we see that this should be and uh, must be a part of the sidewalk repair program. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what, what you're saying. I, I guess my point is that um, with the existing situation, no, exist, no additional resources for the sidewalk repair program, it's not going to be a, a program that will, it'll be additional uh, uh, responsibility that the sidewalk program is not ready to take on right now. Uh, it would be basically not, it would probably be along with all the other requests that we get from incentive program access requests. And so it would not, there'd be no prioritization that we could address. 
unless it was, um, and I just want to make, make that clear, if, that, if it was going to be part of the sidewalk program, it, it would fall in, into all the other requests that we receive, and there would be no, at this point, we don't know, you know, again, I don't know how much, the, what the, the amount of the request would be, so I can't speak to how quickly they would be addressed, you know, how timely those requests would be addressed. That's all I'm really, really getting at. So maybe to um, yeah. address Mr. Chen's concerns, maybe I would ask that your committee amend one of your instructions to ask for a consolidation of lists not only between the Department of Transportation and Department of Disability, but the Bureau of Engineering as well, because they are receiving um, what we call access requests and par um, parceling them out to the Bureau of Street Services to do the repairs. And the access requests coming under the sidewalk repair program um, are essentially uh, an overlap with the same constituency we would be serving with the Blue Curb program. So to understand who the constituency is and the volume that we're serving, uh, the locations, um, it may be most appropriate to do a comparison or consolidation of all three lists and then add in the report back in the future to have one intake instead of three potential intakes, one outreach program instead, through DOD instead of two and so forth. So. Um, I would ask that you recommend, or you, you, you modify your recommendation to include a consolidation of all three lists. Uh, happy to do so. Angela? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add for staffing purposes, um, the sidewalk repair access program, access request program, has hit our department very hard. Um, we've only been given one staff member who is not even full-time on the sidewalk program and it has really exceeded our capacity. Yeah. Um, and I have actually been out of the office for about a month um, on a medical leave. So, um, you know, again, we're trying our best to keep up with the constituents. Now that they know it's out there, we are getting the requests where, you know, I need a blue curb and my sidewalk's broken. Right. So there are times that the requests are coming in at the same time. Right. Um, again, from my department, our really big issue is really trying to manage um, all the, the volume that we're getting as well um, with the staffing that we currently have right. and still maintain all of the other <laughs> accessibility issues throughout the city and address right. um, the concerns that come from the council and the mayor. So the, the one thing I'd ask is that a week from now when you inevitably find out that all three of the departments maintain their lists in different programs in different formats, uh, uh, reach out to ITA or let us know immediately that there is a hurdle so we can figure out how to resolve it. Don't come back in 180 days and say, oh, you know, they have a, theirs is in a locked Adobe format and we have 1,100 things we have to personally retype or something like that. Well, I know at the DOT level we are fully prepared to modify the MyLA DOT system mm -hmm. to create a separate blue curb tab. And it's just a matter yeah. of, of implementing it as soon as it goes through council. Actually, um, the, the plan was on the My LADOT, we already created a, a placeholder for Blue Curb so that any, any requester would, would log in a single database, and that would be the uh, My LADOT. The um, Bureau of Engineering has also very successfully um, created a, an intake page for the sidewalk repair program. Um, where they've also got a, a button up for access service requests. Um, they spent thousands of hours of time putting that together and, and trying to make sure that that works properly. So I think as part of the report back, we're going to have to evaluate both options and find one logical way for people to enter the system and for us to yeah. get data into one um, database so that we're not tripping over ourselves as we right. try to implement this. And so that should be part of the report back. We've asked uh, engineering and DOT would be flexible and work with ITA and then come back with a consolidated yes. uh, request. Absolutely. Response. Okay. Anything else? Just one obvious question, and since you brought up all the lawsuits, um, you guys are taking into account the visibility um, um, uh, when you're installing the accessible parking zones, especially in intersections, you're taking the need for visibility of the extended red curves at these intersections, right? Uh, yes, we, we have to include, well, you mean the red, the red curb with, in conjunction with the blue curb? Uh, uh, yes, because I, so, I, I do know there was about um, $23 million in judgments payout in relation to visit, the lack of uh, insufficient visibility at, uh, of, of it at, during inter, at intersections. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that that's being taken into account, which I'm sure is an obvious question. Actually, but I just wanted and, to and, in this case, yeah. 
it, it should be something that's reviewed because when we take the measurements to install the curb colors, we should notice that the red curb may uh, maybe need to be lengthened and then accommodate both as well as the new uh, blue uh, curb color as well. Okay. That's all. Okay. So without objection, uh, as uh, as I stated, and then as uh, Mr. Hirano perfected, uh, uh, that'll be the recommendation of the committee. And receive and file the department's report. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, seeing it for the business, we are adjourned. Okay. Thank you.